As I said, I am excited because it crosses two of my passions, which is flying and reading. And I read her book a little over a year ago, I guess, or somewhere in that time frame. And from that point on, I've been saying I have got to get Erica on the show with me. And we finally made it happen. I was sharing with her as a couple of minutes ago as we were talking that I really wanted to get her in the month of March because this is Women's History Month. And Erica's in a field that is growing more and more with women in it. But at the time she started, there weren't many. And in the real, if you look at percentage wise, it's still not a lot. But it's more than it was. We're making progress. So my guest this morning, and according to her website, says, which came first, the chick or the egg? Erica Armstrong is the chick in the cockpit from the front desk of a busy FBO or FCM to the captain's seat of a commercial airliner. Erica has experienced everything aviation has to offer. She has worked on both sides of the cockpit door and is one of the first modern women airline captains to write a creative nonfiction book about the aviation industry, which highlights the humor and heartbreaking challenges women in our society quietly face. Her book is not what you think it's going to be about. Now, I can attest to that. I was just telling her that on the air whenever I read it. Erica has an extensive social media network, 400,000 passionate aviation geek cult followers at the moment. I'm one of those 400,000 and is a professor of aviation at MSU Denver, director of instructional design, advanced air crew academy, and award-winning staff writer for the Colorado Serenity Magazine. She's the author of A Chick in the Cockpit, and the art of being a pilot. Oh, I got to get that one coming out in 2019. All right. And has over 80 published articles. She's a contributing editor and professional pilot columnist at Plane and Pilot, Disciples of Flight, NYC Aviation, Flying.com, Serenity, Mountain Connection, Contrails, General Aviation News, LinkedIn Influencer, and Business Insider. Most uniquely, Erica was an international corporate airline Red Cross and 24-hour air ambulance pilot captain. She owns Leading Edge Aviation Consulting and is a pilot recruiter and keynote speaker. She has also been an expert witness in high-profile aviation cases. Kept both sides out of court. All right now. Adopted in Seattle but raised in Minnesota, Erica's early membership in the Minnesota's 99s International Women's Pilot Association jump-started her career. After meeting several women pilots who spent their lives complaining about discrimination, Erica decided to handle every challenge with humor and perspective. This attitude and obsessive focus landed her in the captain's seat of a commercial airliner by the age of 30. She also holds a type rating in CE 500 series aircraft and has extensive pilot training from flight safety, semi-flight, NATO, or NATO, CAE, or NATCO, CAE, Pan Am, and has flown 28 different types of aircraft, including the full Citation series, Falcon 20, King Air 90, 100, 201 hour, and a Russian Yak. <laughs> <laughs> the back experience with education, Erica attended the University of Minnesota's journalism program as an undergraduate before being lured into the, I told you, my two passions in the world of aviation. To round out her education, she attended Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University and has a BA degree in international business, economics, and culture with National Honor Society recognition from the University of Denver. Erica Armstrong, welcome to the Reading Circle Microphones. Good morning, Mark. Rise and shine today. Yes, indeed, because uh, for those of you in the listening audience, you know, if you're on the East Coast here, it's about 7 o'clock our time, 7.05, but Erica's calling from the mountain time, so she's two hours behind us. <laughs> so <laughs> I thank you for rising early, but even though as a pilot, though, your schedule probably changes so much, it probably doesn't phase you. Oh, these, these are aviation hours. <laughs> it's 24-7, 365, so... <laughs> We don't, there's no such thing as weekends or early mornings. That's just part of the day. That's correct. I mean, there's some people who are night people, morning people, some people, I mean, but like when you're like, interesting enough, like coming in this morning, because I'm the first show of the day here on the studio live show. And so for me to get into the studio, the police let me in. And we were talking about this same thing because they have crazy schedules because every 28 days or, sh- or so they switch from day shift to night shift and it really gets crazy with the sleep patterns. Oh, yes. But I know as pilots, you all get into the, like those, the sleep pattern thing as well. You know, late flights, early flights, connect, you know, connecting flights. 
So I say all that to say I thank you for rising this early, but at the same time for you, now for some people it would be a really issue, but for you it's kind of like par for the course. Exactly. Yeah, you definitely get used to setting your body clock for whatever time zone you need to be in. Wow. So, all right, let's go back to the beginning in terms of, because interestingly enough, I'm reading a book now about doing more than one thing career-wise. It's something having to do with what we call slash. We call slash people. Like whenever you do your bio, you put like pilot slash author slash motivational speaker slash. You're a slash person according to that book. (laughs) (laughs) I am. That's a good term. (laughs) So let's talk a little bit like how did we work our way into that? Like you started with journalism and business and so forth and so on, and then you'd made the shift to, to aviation. So work us through that. Okay. Um, well, actually, becoming a pilot was a complete accident. Um, never ha- growing up, ever even once thought about becoming a pilot. Um, you know, I think growing up and graduating of high school in, in the mid-80s, um, there, there really weren't a lot of women pilots. There, there was a couple, um, and of course, iconic Amelia Earhart. Um, you know, she was the only female icon, and you know, it didn't turn out so well for her, so there wasn't really a lot of incentive um, to, to bring women into the industry. So um, I was always interested in writing and reading, and, and I love that, and just really wasn't sure what to do, but want, you know, wanted to go to college, and so entered into the journalism program. And um, I was working a couple of just crummy jobs and realizing I didn't have enough money to pay rent and tuition and all the books coming up, so I was looking for a third job to fit into my schedule. And, of course, aviation is 24-7, so... They had some really weird hours available to work at the front desk at a little airport called Flying Cloud, um, southwest of Minneapolis, not too far from where I was living. So I went over, interviewed, and um, got the job working the front desk of um, a company on the field there. They um, catered to pilots coming in. They also had a small charter department. They had a large maintenance department. And uh, so I just started learning about the industry from the front desk side and meeting the pilots and the, the workers in the industry and hanging out with the line guys, and they were all taking flight training next door. And, you know, after, you know, spending some time with them, I'm thinking, well, these guys aren't any smarter than anybody else, and, and they're doing it. <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, you know, that, there's a flight school right next door. Why not take a lesson? And I took a lesson, and I was hooked. Um, just never looked back. I, it, it is such an incredible feeling, you know, even as a journalist, I failed to, you know, relay the emotions that it, that you experience sitting in an airplane all by yourself above the earth, looking down on everybody. And uh, uh, once you've been up there, it, it's hard to leave it again. I think, and I, I don't know if you can put it in words, and I say that only because as I was sharing with you a couple of minutes ago, I was a jet engine mechanic. And I would tell people all the time, whenever I was on the flight line, around the fighter jets, working with the pilots and so forth and so on, just to be out there and to be around that much energy, to be around equipment that size and so forth, like you really can't put it into words. Right. It has a certain smell and a tone and a texture and, yeah, just having all that, that heavy iron out there just, you know, and looking at the marvel of what a human brain can do when we all work together the engineer an airplane plane is just it's incredible and i think something about in terms of av for those of us who are aviation geeks and even for those who are not i just think even okay let me put it this way the average person doesn't know the theory the nits and the nats of flight I mean, like bernoulli's theorem and all that kind of good stuff they don't they right. don't but even those of us who do it's still fascinating to us how that whole thing occurs how something that large stays up in the air Right. I was having a conversation with somebody the other day about cruise ships, how something that large stays on the water. I mean, it's just it's just a mystery. Even though, like I said, if we know the theory behind everything, even though we know, you know, air and, you know, whether how it hits the wings and the rise and this, that, and, even though you know, it's still like, wow, this thing stays in the air. And I can't imagine what it must be like to be the one commanding it. Right? <laughs> yeah. And that, unfortunately, that's also what causes fear in people, too, is, is because of the unknown. Um, I, I, I get emails 
weekly saying, hey, I'm afraid to fly. What can you do to help me? Um, and knowledge is power, definitely, in that regard. So um, that, that's the beauty and the fear of it, too, for the, for the general public. Well, it is. And now I know whenever I'm, when I take flights, I, I hate, it's going to sound bad. It really is. Because I do know what the sounds and everything are, what's going on when you're raising the flaps or this, the speed brakes or the landing gears coming out. I know what all those sounds are. It, for me, it's funny to look around and see passengers' faces as they tense up right. when, they, when, okay. they, when they hear these different noises. <laughs> <laughs> right. like, like you get in an Airbus and it sounds like there's a barking dog down in the cargo bay and <laughs> they're looking at each other going, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> but it is, so what was it like for you, now that you had made this decision kind of like, and you're right, you're like, well, if those guys can do it, so can I. I mean, what was it like for you now once you made that decision and now you entered into the field? Well, it, you know, there was, it was still a huge barrier to, to break through that first right. um, entry into a paid position. So, um, you know, the, the rules back then were slightly different. Now, um, pilots these days have an additional challenge of trying to earn um, quite a few more hours before they can get in the, the right seat of an airplane. But um, I worked at the, that FBO for six years. Um, it took um, about five years of knocking on the chief pilot's door weekly and begging and conjoling, trying to get just in the right seat of a King Air. So a, a King Air is a twin-engine turbine airplane, but it only requires one pilot to fly it. Um, it's not a, you don't necessarily need a second officer on it, but the operation specifications for the charter company that I was working for required a first officer. So um, if they could take in low-time pilots to sit over there, and basically you're just getting the captain his coffee and, um, you know, helping with the passengers and then basically running the radios. But what you're really doing is just learning vast experience or um, gaining vast knowledge by watching these captains fly, um, understanding, you know, the intricacies of, of all the the weather and the flight planning and dealing with flying into, un, you know, unfamiliar airports and all the challenges of, um, of ATC and, everything else from the right seat of that airplane. So um, I, once I got there and started earning some hours, um, all those rest of those doors started opening up. And see, again, as I have you here on Women's History Month, and like you said, now you're talking like in the 80s. You are, we're, we're very, I'm, I'm older than you by a few years, but we're, we came through about the same time. Okay. And so we're talking, because for me, when I hear 80s, that still doesn't sound like a long time ago to me, even though it is. But, yeah. but we're talking now, as you say, in the 80s, there weren't many women pilots. And that wasn't, to me, that long ago. So you can imagine prior to you, there were even less. What, right. what was it like, kind of like you're, you're cracking into an industry that is male-dominated? I mean, did they, were they accepting of that, or were they always kind of like taking shots at you, or, or, or were they helpful, or what was going on there? What was that like to, like I said, try to break into an industry that was male-dominated? Well, all of the above. <laughs> so for, for <laughs> as many people as exist out there, there's that many opinions. But you know what? When I look back on the whole span of my career, 90% of the guys I flew with were professional. They could care less if it was a man or woman. And that 10% of people that were jerks are going to be jerks no matter what. Right. You know, it, it didn't matter. I, you, know, they, you know, there are the misogynists out there, and I definitely flew with them, and they are... They are terrifying. Um, you know, they, they actually create an unsafe environment. Um, it's completely unprofessional. And the problem is that if you look at their whole behavior, it's not just inter interactions with women. In general, they, they really have low emotional intelligence. So I kind of learned, especially when I started flying in a multi-crew environment, and especially at the airlines, I had to change my perspective. Um, you know, I would walk into the cockpit door, and I really did have the power over them because I was used to that ratio. I was used to being the only woman in right. the room. So when I walked in the door, I felt like I was actually more powerful in that situation because they were not familiar with flying with a woman. So my goal each time was to put them at ease, understand I'm there to do a job just like them, and then I'm going to do a job just like them. And we were going to have some fun, and we were going to be safe. And, you know, we ended up, I ended up making lifelong friends with some of these people that I'm sure were ap apprehensive to have a woman step in the cockpit. 
Well, I saw something posted on one of the social media sites. And I don't know if you were the one who posted it or it was somebody else. But in any event, it said the plane doesn't know if a male or female is flying it. Well, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's getting better. Um, I think we're up to maybe 5% of um, airline ATP pilots. Um, airline pilots are women. But what I'm seeing um, is in the business aviation world, there's a lot more women entering that category which means eventually they'll be stepping up into the into the airline world too. So I, I see those numbers coming, um, but you know it, it takes a generation or two to get used to that idea. And I strongly believe that my kids won't even think twice about seeing a woman do this. Um, I, I still remember the day I was standing in the grocery store with my two little girls, and I'm standing there. And there's a pilot who was behind me, and he had his bars off, but I could tell he was a pilot. It looks like he had just flown in. And I told my daughter, I said, we're going to let this gentleman go ahead. He had just a small basket and I've got this huge you know, family shopping cart full of food. So I said, we're going to let this pilot go ahead of us. And my daughter looked at me and she's like, how did you know he was a pilot? And I, you know, I said, well, I explained the uniform and everything. And, and she looked at me and she's like, well, mom, do you let boys be pilots? <laughs> and I was like, I just, I, I'm standing in the grocery store, and I thought that was the most poignant thing I'd ever heard anybody say, and, you know, coming from a five-year-old. So <laughs> That's a different perspective. So from her lens, she's so accustomed to the female pilot, she didn't know the males could be pilots. Exactly. Wow. And I thought, oh, isn't that key, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, again... I in, in I, I remember back in the 70s, and I was young, I was a kid at the time, but I mean, I was old enough to follow the news and everything, and that's whenever the women's lib movement was really kind of kicking off, late 60s, early 70s, what have you, and it was this whole notion of women can do what men can do, and I was like... I don't understand what the issue is. <laughs> right. I, I never understood what was the issue with that. If you want to drive a truck, drive a truck. If you want to, whatever, you want to climb the telephone or climb the telephone pole. But, I mean, a lot of people would were, were really, I mean, it was, I, I can remember, it was a time folks were really fighting a lot of things. Well, why can't a woman do it? And see, I'm speaking now as a father of four girls. I couldn't uh. buy a boy. So it's <laughs> it's like, <laughs> as a father of four girls, I'm constantly, you can do whatever it is that you feel like you want to do. Whatever you want to do, go for it. Absolutely. And so whenever I read books like yours or I talk to people like you, it is really an inspiration because you're one that really has gone out there and done it. Well, and unfortunately, aviation, it's not unfortunate, but you have to have a certain amount of ego to be in there, right? There oh, cool. some, oh, for sure. You know, you've seen it, especially in the military world, right. too. So it's a necessity to have that, um, that drive inside of you. It, it, and oftentimes it does come out as ego. And sometimes if, if you don't know how to control it, it just comes out off as dysfunctional. So, um, you know, the industry itself, doesn't mean to be male dominated, I, I don't believe, but that's kind of the, the personality that drives towards that industry. Right. So, in terms of now, you're you've made the shift to become a pilot, and I guess one of the things for me, because my slash other than radio show hope is is, is educator. Mm-hmm. So in terms of working with children who might be looking into that career, do they have to be like these super mathematicians or, or what kind of like what do they need to kind of prepare for if they if you want to be a pilot? Yeah, and I love that question because and I, I love the whole STEM incentive, but I also think that it maybe puts a, a stigma that there is some sort of extra level that you need to be at to be a pilot, <laughs> not to diminish a pilot's right. abilities, but so when I teach my students now, um, when they come into my class, I explain to them that I do not want to see a pilot wash out of this system because they can't take a multiple choice test. So I give my students opportunities to show me how they learn in different ways. You know, even on um, you know, a, a test, I'll ask short answer essays, um, as well as multiple choice, some visual um, questions and answers. Pilots are really visual people. Right. Um, so when I teach, it's always backed up with a, a picture and a video and um, multiple ways of learning. So the math in aviation is, is really common sense. It's, you know, fuel uploads, moving weight and balance around. Um, you know, there's formulas for it, and 
in aviation, you're allowed to look everything up. So I, I you know, people that struggle with math or believe they can't be a pilot because they can't do math, uh, there is a common sense way for you to learn. So don't let that stop you. Well, again, I think in terms of the industry in and of itself, because I know for me, I, whenever I'm in an airport and I see you all coming in those uniforms, and I'm almost like in awe. And it's like, <laughs> uh, you know, the whole industry is kind of considered a sexy industry, if you will. Yeah. Uh, my wife and I was talking because she has her MBA, and I think they actually had had done something on aviation or on the airlines industry, and that was one of the things that came out throughout the course that the industry in and of itself has this perception of a sexy industry. As you all, and you were just talking about ego. As I mean, and do you, as you go through airports, do you realize people are looking at you all like those? They just move that tonnage out there they just took us from point a to point b in the air what what, what? <laughs> well i guess i always do wonder what people think um it's so funny because we all us pilots know we have to put on like our serious faces when we walk through the terminal right, so, right. <laughs> you see the pilot face and half of them are pretending to talk on the cell phone so that people aren't asking them directions you'd be amazed if people ask they like, which door do i pick up my baggage from and you know <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's ironic though that you say that because you know we're we're facing this really bad pilot shortage, and, and I believe that some of the core of the problem is that it has lost the edge of that sexiness. Um, it used to be where it was a glamorous life, and um, you know there was respect for the pilots and for the flight attendants, and it was a noble pr- profession. But it, it, you know, over the years, um, that, that image has kind of been tarnished and diminished, and it's kind of been layers of challenges in the industry that have kept people turning away from the, coming into the industry. Um, you know, it's not a, a simple one thing that happened, but it was just layers of things. Um, and of course, you know, 9-11. Right. Kind of a turning point, um, really putting security up around all the small airports and that, I grew up in Minnesota, and I know on the weekends, we, people would just come out on the weekends, open up the hangar door, they'd pull out their lawn chairs, and they'd just shoot the breeze and tell stories and talk about aviation. The kids could come over and hang on the fence and watch the airplanes land. And unfortunately, we had to shut that all down and um, just created a distance between the, the next generation and that, that current group of pilots. So um, uh, the industry right now is trying to, polish that back up and, and entice more pilots in, but they're struggling right now. That's amazing. And you're absolutely right. I remember as a kid, we were talking about Newark Liberty. That was before it was named Newark Liberty. It was just Newark Airport. But as a kid, my father would take us and we could go out. Like they, it wasn't closed off by glass or anything in terms of like they had a deck out there that you can go stand and watch planes come and go on the runway. And over the years for various terrorist acts, they closed everything off. Like you can, you can do that anymore. So, like you said, the the connection for a child to be able to even get close to mm-hmm. to aircraft like that really the barriers are there. But that's amazing. And I think the other thing in terms of because there's a, because it's it's it was perceived as a sexy industry. People always thought also that it was a very high paying industry, <laughs> not realizing that you have to work your way up salary wise and position wise and. You know, from co-pilot to first officer, to, you know, we had the, at one time, we had the flight engineers. I don't, I don't even know if all the planes require a flight engineer now. Most of them don't. No. But yeah. I remember when you had a flight engineer, you had your, you know, your first officer would co-pilot, your captain, so forth and so on, that you work your way up to those positions. And of course, the salaries goes with it. Um, so a lot of times when people look in the salary guide and see like, wait a minute, to do this, I get that. Some of them are saying... I don't think I'll, it's worth the effort as well. And I don't know if that's part of it also. Because the other thing is people, especially if you're the customer buying a ticket, you just assume airlines make money. Airlines in and of itself is not a very profitable business or it's a tough profitable business. Let's put it that way. Right. Right. The profit margins are really slim. Right. Right. Um, yeah, so deregulation um, was another key at turning point, too, for the entire industry. Right. Um, allowing it to run purely on capitalism, that definitely changed it. But, uh, yeah, the pilot pay, of course, is, is the number one issue. Um, right now, pilots are spending hundreds, 
about a hundred thousand dollars because you need um, a college degree right. and fifteen hundred hours to get in the seat. Right. So you you know you're looking at a hundred thousand dollars in debt to make maybe forty thousand dollars the first couple of years while you're flying. Right. Um, when I got hired at um, Northwest or Champion Air as a flight engineer, I made eighteen thousand dollars a year. <laughs> so, uh huh. Uh, um, and I had been in business aviation before that, so I had to take about a sixty-five percent pay cut to go to the airlines. Um, wow. it's, it's definitely changed. Um, even in the last two years, it's been a significant increase. I'd say probably pay across the board is at least 30% higher for starting in, um, you know, the regionals. Regional carriers used to pay literally minimum wage. Pilots were on food stamps, could qualify for food stamps, um, but they, they've had to change their business plan. Um, and, but unfortunately, after years of that, the older generation has discouraged the next generation coming in because it has been so so volatile, so many mergers and takeovers and so much unhappiness and bitterness as these um, businesses merge and take over and pilot lists get merged and your quality of life goes down when your seniority number goes down. Um, it, it's stabilized now really because there's nobody else to merge with. Right. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's helped the industry. <laughs> That is true. So, but and and again, back on the social media sites and everything, I see airlines now offering up forty and fifty thousand dollars signing bonuses to try to offset some of the the debt of the school trying to get in there. Yeah, especially if you can come in with a type rating. I know they're offering at the regionals. If you come in with a type rating, um, or your at least your ATP, they do have sign on bonuses, and and boy, that that certainly helps. Um, there's still still first year pay is probably going to still be about sixty thousand um, dollars. You'll be gone a lot. You'll be sitting on reserve probably someplace not in your where you live. You'll have right. to be based someplace else. Um, so there's you know out of pocket expense for your life having to live somewhere else. But um, it's still getting better. The carrot is is hanging out there and a little bit closer now. Being able to move up to captain seat in in a year used to be unheard of. People used to sit for years right. in the right seat. So that, that's another element, too, is so much movement. Um, you, you're getting pilots quicker in that left seat. So in terms of, and very quickly, we were talking about the, the female or the or women pilots. I had never read a Danielle Steele book. As big as Danielle Steele is in terms of her various fiction books, I read my first one, and it's called Accidental Heroes, and it's about a female pilot. That's oh, what the, the, I haven't read that. Okay, you you will enjoy it. It's it's okay. fiction, but I mean, and and but I had never, you know, Danielle still she's been around for like ever and just known for doing the novels and everything. But that one I read because it was dealing with a female cat and some of the things that she she highlighted in terms of, you know, the guys and you know how the, she was treated and so forth and so on. And she was she was like a top notch pot. I won't give the story if you're going to read it, but you you would enjoy it. So, did you hide when you were reading a Danielle Steele novel? <laughs> did you have to go in the closet and read? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> see, like, like I said, for me, I don't get the gender thing. I really don't. <laughs> it's like, whatever you want to do, you do. So, yeah, that's right. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I, I really did enjoy it and uh, because it, it was aviation related. Like, I. I mean, I I've, I read a lot of aviation type books because, again, because it's just something that I just really just love. I just find it fascinating. And you were talking about in terms of like being assigned or living somewhere else. I noticed like even with the flight attendants, a lot of them will just it'll be five or six or seven of them have a, an apartment somewhere, and they're all on call. Yep. Are the pilots yeah, the same way? Yeah, same way. When you're first starting out, you sit reserved. So I had many crash pads that I shared. Um, with pilots and flight attendants, like um, you know, when I was based in St. Louis, I had there were seven of us in a part in an apartment, and we were constantly rotating in and out of this crash pad. And um, you know, so if you were the last person in, of course, you had to sleep on the floor because there's nowhere else to right. go. And so, yeah, um, sometimes the red eyes were good to have on those you know pairings when everybody was there. And so you're out working at night, so then you had the place to yourself during the day and um, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, kind of a, 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 an unusual life that most people don't realize is going on right. behind the scenes too. 
Absolutely. And that's, for me, when I'm reading these books, is the behind the scenes that always captured my attention. Because it's one thing to see you all walking around the airport. It's one thing to see you in the play. It's another to understand everything. Because there are a lot of challenges that goes with the industry as well. Right. I mean, in terms of some of the things that you just talked about. Well, it's all-consuming. It's not a job that you do and then just go home. Even beyond the working of, you know, the flights, beyond that, we're going to get our flight physicals every six months. We're taking check rides. We're going to ground school. We're going to recurrent ground schools. We're getting called in for, um, you know, special meetings over separate topics. And so, you know, in addition, in addition to all the schedules that you've got set, you've got all this other time spent on the industry, on your job, um, that, that most people don't realize that we're still doing. No, it's very intense. It's not just a matter of flying around from place to place and just having a blast. It is extremely intense in terms of, because one, you have to be on point in terms of what you're doing because so many lives you are responsible for. So they really have to know that you always are, are ready to go, ready you know, and healthy and nothing is impairing your judgment and so forth and so on. So I, I get it. I understand that. And that's why, I mean, when you really think about it and people really don't get this, and even when you say it, they look at you kind of like funny. Air travel is actually safer than car travel. Oh, my gosh. No comparison. Yeah, we've, what, 3,000 people today will die in a car accident. And all of last year, actually, and all of the last two years, we had one passenger fatality. Um, and, you know, such an anomaly, too. It is so... I. So beyond safe, I, it's hard to even quantify. Right. Um, yeah. It, it really is. And that's why we were talking earlier before we went on air about folks who are you know, afraid to fly or what have you, but they really don't understand. No, you're actually safer up there than you are down here. <laughs> well, and of course, right now with the current news, I'm right. you know, in everybody's focus. So, um, yeah, we got to keep those numbers in mind. Yeah, it is. And I guess the only difference is because, one, if an airliner does crash, it makes major news. And two, the likelihood of more people being hurt or killed is, is high because you have two or three or 400, 500 people, whatever it is, at the same time simultaneously. But that's what it is. It makes a big splash. But number percentage-wise, no, you're, you're safer in the air than you are in your own car. But what is it like as you're sitting there in the cockpit, do, in, in your mind, or has that ever come to you? Do you ever think back in terms of all of everything that's behind you. Do I mean what? What is that like to be in up there? And now they call it the flight deck. They don't even call it the cockpit anymore. They call it the flight deck. What is it like to be in the flight deck? Because they got into this <laughs> political correctness. So do I. <laughs> but it's like, folks, I mean, folks really they get bent out of shape about that. Folks, oh, it's not the cockpit. One. <laughs> Yeah. You have to call it the flight deck. I'm like, oh. right. I'm like okay, all right, whatever. I'm like, I'm like, really, you're yelling at me for calling it the cockpit? <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, no, the passengers are definitely, you know, it's, it's a heavy weight on your head. Um, I made it a point, especially when I moved up into that captain seat, um, to just, before we shut that cockpit door, I would just take one quick look back and to remind myself of the responsibility of that chair. Um, and with the billions of variables that happen in aviation, having that knowledge that you're responsible for them puts your thought pattern in, in, a, in a safety circle that will, will keep you thinking within that safety decision-making process. So um, I, I definitely make it a point to, to look back there before I shut the door, and then as soon as I shut that door, I'm, I'm, I'm back to the captain's seat, and that's all I can think about is between – me and my crew in this airplane and all the elements we're going to challenge ahead and um, just take it one step at a time. Now, for me, I love technology. I really do. But this nonsense, for me, is nonsense. I'll couch it with my personal opinion. But for me, it's nonsense of this whole notion of pilotless planes. Uh, yeah, right. We have one simple system, MCAS system, installed in a Boeing 737. Benign little thing, and look what's happened, Right. Exactly. Yeah, we are so far away from having um, autonomous large passenger aircraft. Um, it, it will definitely happen. Um, I was telling my students that we may be the last of the the, the adventure pilots out there. You know the way that we see it now, but there will always be pilots. We'll be just doing flying a different way. Um, you know, maybe flying up at sixty thousand feet and above, um, more like. Uh, rocket pilots instead, but um, 
Yeah, I mean, we we were just in the infancy of this technology. Um, it's absolutely amazing how far we've come, but we still have a really long way to go. I just, I just don't see something. And again, based on the the number of lives that that you're dealing with in in one single shot, why you would even think in terms of not having a human being because it is the human element. I mean, the plane can do what it does. I understand autopilot and all that kind of stuff, but there are still things that not autopilot, autopilot can't do that you have to have a human. I don't care. Anyone, as, as great as computers are, they still don't rival the brain. Right. Well, right. So look at, look at the MCAS. It, it has a definite opinion about what it thinks is happening, even though it's completely wrong. And it wasn't letting a pilot tell it that it's wrong. So I can't even get my ice maker to make ice correctly. And it's a, <laughs> it's a new refrigerator so, <laughs> and freezer. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's true so that's why i like every time i see something on it and it's like a big debate every time i see something you know an article on it of course i'm like i don't even understand why they're even thinking about trying to do something like that i personally i don't even like the cars without drivers oh, I'm like it's i'm money not, right oh okay, yes right. i get it right <laughs> those engineers sit there the the ceos are like well let's just you know, get the pilot out of there and look at all the money we'll save. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I won't go down that road in terms of like a few lawsuits will wipe that right out. But in any event, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but that's just I don't like I won't. I'm the, they're, they're talking the same thing with cars, driverless cars. I said you won't. I won't be getting in there. <laughs> I will not <laughs> be okay, exactly. I will not be sitting on the passenger seat of a driverless car. <laughs> I don't even like be honest with you sitting in the passenger seat of a drivered car. But right, <laughs> I like to drive. I want to be the driver, but <laughs> certainly not a driverless car and most certainly not a pilotless plane. Oh, no, thank you. Won't be me sitting back there. But no, it, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So when you now decided, because now you're putting the sl back to the slash and the title of that book is One Person, Multiple Careers. When you now decided to become an author, were you doing that simultaneously or... Was it something you, I mean, how, how, first of all, how did, was that something you did on downtime? Because there is no downtime as being a pilot. So how did you come up with, with the book? So um, I'm an avid reader, and actually one of the good things about being a commuter, so I would have to commute to my base, and like, I was based in Denver, and I would have to commute to Detroit. That's a long flight, right? So I had opportunity to read a novel every single week. I Anytime I had a few minutes to myself, it was such a great way to, to disconnect from the world. Even if I was sitting in a busy airport, I could just put on my headphones, not even listen to music, just turn out the noise and read books and stories to help unwind and relax. So I've always had that passion to read, and I've always you know, been writing on the side. Um, so becoming an author was not ever my intention just like becoming a pilot i didn't think i'd ever read a, write actually write a book i liked reading or writing uh, magazine articles you know short stories talking about aviation adventures and sharing that passion and joy in, in little tiny small doses um but like you said i had a flash in my life and um my flying career was suddenly taken away from me and um just like life, right? It turns on a dime and things change and having the experience of trying to deal with this identity of who I was and having to suddenly reevaluate who I am, what my capabilities are and what I could do with a, a bad situation. Um, I actually ended up writing my book for my book club group. Um, they, When you read the book, you'll find out that they right. did this small little favor for me, which I'm sure they thought you know, didn't amount to a hill of beans, but for me it was a turning point, and um, it was my incentive to, to share my full story with this book club that only knew a small chapter of what they'd been seeing. Right. See, this is what we were talking about earlier in the book. Is the book is not what you think it is. It is what it isn't, because it's certainly, Erica talks about the aviation piece, but then she gets into life. And uh, Erica, I tell you, if I was watching it in a movie, I'd be wanting to jump through the screen. I was I was literally wanting to jump in the book. <laughs> I was like, "Are you?" I'm sitting there like, "Are you kidding me?" But that's and that's but that happens because again, when we start talking domestic abuse, the percentage on that is very high. Right, way higher than I even thought. 
Um, it's still one of those taboo things, right. even though I've experienced it. You know, my tendency is, oh, I just, I can't take any more. It's just so heartbreaking. Right. Um, and it's still rampant. And, you know, I, just like gender challenges over the years, it's getting better. And it's getting better because we're talking about it. Right. And it's, but it's really hard still. Um, but trying to get to the core basis of, you know, why that happens, why in our society anyone believes that that should or could still happen and what we can do for help to help people get out of those situations. Well, it is extreme because I, I mean, we have, fa- I have family members who we suspect is in that situation and she has not been able to get out of that. As a matter of fact, as I was reading your book, some of the exact same patterns were, I, we, I could sit there, I could see that in my family member with, with relatives like, mm, that's, that's a classic um, symptom, for lack of a better word, or a classic pattern. There, it's it, because abusers have those, and you don't know them. Like just like you're saying in your book, as you know, I'm not going to give the book away because I really do. All, I do want you all to get the book, A Chicken a Cockpit, um, because you don't know an abuser as you meet him or her. Right. right. You don't. You and don't you, know you, that. You nailed it. There, there is a pattern, um, and when you're in it, you don't realize it. So. When you get out and you look back and you say, whoa, how could I have been so stupid, right? Um, but there is a pattern, and part of that pattern, too, is because those abusers are often so outgoing, so charming, right. there's a trigger in them that covers up that right. dark side. Um, so they work so much harder at it that um, you know, you're lulled into believing um, because it's so far the other way. You think, how could they possibly go to that dark side? No, absolutely. And and with somebody, I mean, very attractive woman. I've seen your pictures. I've posted them all over the place. Career. So I was like, well, how would somebody, but that doesn't matter to an abuser. Right. 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 Um, yeah, definitely a pattern. Um, I, you know, unknowingly had set myself up for it. Moving to an unfamiliar town, um, allowing my finances to be, for him to get onto my finances. Right one at a time, and, you know, I, I was so busy and I was so disconnected, really, um, from, you know, paying attention or looking for those signs. Um, you know, I was, I'd be gone for two weeks and I'd come home and, um, you know, glad to see, see him and, and not realizing fully the pattern that I was letting myself get into. Right. But yeah, I would. I mean, like I said, if it was one of those, like if you ever watch a movie and you want to get in there and you want to beat up a character, you want to. That's the way I'm reading that. Like, oh, if I could just get in there. <laughs> it's like, are you? Like, like I said, I'm sitting there reading it. Like, like I'm looking at your testimonials in here, and I could relate to what the people are saying in terms of how they were because I was feeling the exact same way. <laughs> Well, and, and it, even though it's domestic abuse, there's still a common theme because life is unfair. Right. We are going to have those things in our lives that are going to happen to you. You're going to say, what the hell? Right. <laughs> you know, I did not deserve that. Um, and, and things are going to happen, and they're going to be completely unfair, but you still have to move on. And see, that's the, that's the inspirational point for me in terms of even with those setbacks, you still say, okay, fine. It's a setback. I'm going to move on. There you go. Yeah. And at the time I was writing this book, um, there were some great books and I love like eat, pray, love. I love wild, right. love those books. But at the core of it, I'm watching women have a challenge and their response to that challenge are things that the rest of us can't do. We, we can't take off and hike the Pacific Coast Highway. We can't take off and travel the world for a year, you know, eat, pray, love. The rest of us have to stay here and deal with it, right? <laughs> That's right. So I wanted to present an alternative to having a challenge placed in front of you and saying, look, here's, <laughs> it's going to happen in some way to you. Right. What can you do to move on? Right. Yeah, my my sister is struggling right now. She was, she's already, I believe, was was diabetic, I believe, or at least she didn't, knew it or didn't. I'm not sure. But then she wound up with congestive heart failure, uh, and so she's struggling with that now. But I mean, when I tell you, like for her, it has really been a struggle. And the message that you just said is the one that I've been trying to encourage her with. Like, okay, life isn't fear. Like life, you know, things do happen. It just, I know it's inconvenient. I know it's discomfort. I know it's this. But you just can't give up. 
Right. And right. and so for those in the listening audience, as you're listening to Erica's story, and again, I highly recommend the book. And I think the other thing that catches why people get caught by surprise is each one of your table of contents is is a flight title. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so now as you're looking at the flight title and you get into a, a section on this happened to me, it's like, well, wait, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot of rounding around with the editor. Um, we were trying to deal with the issue and how to get people to still read a book. Um, because if you tell me that this book is about domestic abuse, even though I've gone through right. it, I probably don't want to read it. Right. You know? Um, so we were trying to find a way to still educate people, bring them into the cockpit for the first time, have some fun, and it, just to experience a life change uh, in somebody's life um, that you're still going to find parallels with um, right. despite the circumstances. Exactly. Yeah. So going back to the title again, we were talking earlier about using the word cockpit because you also had another word that, you know, sends flames up folks as well or inflames folks is the word chick. Right. So, <laughs> so I mean, it's like, I love it because it's like, I'm not necessarily one who cares for all this political correctness and all this kind of stuff. So when it, that was another thing that caught my eye. I was like, wait a minute, a chick in the cockpit. I'm like, wait a minute. You, <laughs> usually, you know, there uh, it would have to be a, you know, I'm trying to think how we reword that to be politically correct. A female in the flight deck. I mean, something. Yeah. I don't. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, that's, uh, uh, everybody needs to lighten up. Uh, right. <laughs> I have been berated so many times by men and women saying how awful I am for naming the book that. And I'm like, those are not my people. I'm not here to please you. <laughs> this is, you got to have some fun in life or you cannot make it through. No, I could not agree more. Laughter is so important and humor in that whole. And, and I mean, even that is a major aid in how even when bad things happen, you react and respond to it. Absolutely. Being able to to look at it from a, a humorous perspective, or at least be able to try to, as they say, get the silver lining out of it somewhere in there. Like some good is going to come out of this. I don't know what the good is, but some good <laughs> is going to come out of this. <laughs> it can be it, it can be hard. If it make it your challenge, right. that's what I did, especially when I was flying a, with a flight crew. When, we had a three-person flight crew. And if I had two male pilots in there that had the misogynist <laughs> trait, um, it could be an absolutely miserable m month of flying. Um, so I definitely had to come into that cockpit armed with some sort of emotional <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, cannons, and that's the only way I could do it is to just view it with just the audacity of humor and um, realizing that these people were just absolute idiots because they couldn't get over themselves. Oh, yeah, for sure. So now, again, going back to the flying days, I'm going back and forth um, in terms of, you know, the flying as, as well as now you're teaching and doing everything else. When you're up there in the cockpit, if the plane's on autopilot, I mean, what, I, mean I know what we're doing in the back whenever I, I'm usually reading or listening to music or sleeping or looking out the window. What are you all doing up there in the cockpit? I mean, I know, but from my listening audience, I mean, I know what you're doing up there because I know all those little dials and, and lights and buttons and everything you have to monitor. <laughs> you got to realize we drone along for hours up there, right? So we have to find things to engage our brain, especially pilots who need interaction. So I hate to tell you this, but we're up there playing dice games. I'm not we're, surprised. <laughs> we're up there playing cards. I mean, we're still monitoring everything, um, but yeah, we are definitely finding ways to to pass the time. Yeah, because it's it's. I mean, once you get to your your altitude, everything you need to be, you can. I mean, and again, listening audience, for those of you especially who are afraid to fly, do not take this conversation as one life. That's why I'm not getting on a plane. But <laughs> in terms of when once you get it on autopilot, it will handle itself. But you do, and this is why I'm going back to the pilotless thing again. Even with autopilot, you still have to monitor what's going on in terms of your altimeter, your altitude, your airspeed, uh, everything else, your hydraulic, everything else that's going on in the plane, you still have to have an eye on. See, that would be my fear for not having a human being up there. Oh, and we're constantly talking to air traffic control. Every right. few minutes we're talking to somebody. So every time we talk to somebody, we, we're, we're scanning everything again and because, you know, you sit there for thousands of hours, we know with one glance where all the engine gauges are supposed to be at right. that regimen of flight. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's an elevated level of, of, 
of concentration um, always so that we can, you know, have conversation and some other just, you know, way to spend the time so that we don't get bored because boredom is the worst thing in the cockpit, right? Right. That's when you stop paying attention. That's absolutely right. Right. Now, do you ever get hit with, because I get offended with this because as a kid, I wanted to be a bus driver. I mean, I always loved transportation. There's something about trucks, planes, cars, all that kind of stuff as a kid. I always loved it. But do you ever get hit with that you all are just glorified bus drivers? <laughs> uh, they can say whatever they want. They'll just never know the actual truth of, of what they do. So they can, they can say whatever they want. Well, like I said, I get, I get offended by it just for the fact that I wanted to be a bus driver. But, <laughs> but to, 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 I mean, I get what, on the one hand, I get you're moving people from place to place. But there is so much more that has to go on in terms of, like I said, that you're talking – a lot of weight, a lot of steel, a lot of lies. You're talking a lot of everything. This is a major league responsibility. I remember, again, you know, working with the Air Force. We had to sign off on everything we did on that engine. <laughs> oh, and, yeah. And they would yeah. tell us if that plane goes up there and something happens to it or it crashes or if it's engine related, we're going to go back to see, did you turn every screw that it was supposed to be turned to the right or to the left? Did you safety wire? Did you just, they, they, they could track who worked well, on I what always, when? I love the conversations between pilots and mechanics. Um, it, it's it's such a tenuous uh, relationship, right? <laughs> and the, the mechanics always playing the, blaming the pilot, the pilot right? blaming the mechanic, and <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> But it, it is. But, yeah, they were very clear on us. We had to sign off on everything. Anytime we touched an engine, we had to sign off on it. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, it is tracked so detailed. But it is. So in terms of, because, again, it is is a major league responsibility. It's, it is a fascinating industry. So now you're teaching. What and In terms of your courses, your coursework, what do you teach in terms of your students coming in? What are, what are they taking with you? So I'm doing it in two different regimes. I work for Advanced Air Crew Academy, and in that regard, I work with flight departments, um, Part 91, Part 135. Um, I go in, I take their op specs, their GOM, and we pull together a training program for their pilots. So in an oddball way, we're making corporate pilots' lives a little bit easier because we've uh, Advanced Air Crew Academy has develop, developed these um, computer-based training, e-learning modules, so that pilots can do their recurrent and initial training at their convenience. Pilots have gone so much already right. to spend an additional 40 hours in a classroom setting at the FBO is pointless. So we put it all online, um, all the testing, all the learning, and everything is tracked and traced. And so um, I helped de- design those curriculums. And then on the other side, working at the university, I'm teaching brand new pilots all about flying. All right. Yeah, I teach uh, aircraft systems and propulsion. I'm teaching instrument fundamentals, and then my favorite is the aviation fundamentals because it's the very first class that they have to take. Um, most of them have never even touched an airplane, so I get to introduce them to this wide, wide world of aviation and. Um, expand the possibilities of their future and there's so many different avenues they can take coming through the program even if they don't want to be a pilot aviation right. has millions of jobs right yeah so it's fun to expose them to all that that all the avenues that they could take so you're doing propulsion i'm like i always remember now the first thing they tell us look all you really need to know is it sucks blows and goes i'm like That's okay it. <laughs> yeah. sucks, please bang and blow <laughs> 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 Turbine, that's right. <laughs> oh my goodness! So now you have a new book. Did it come out yet, or is it on its way? Uh, it's on its way. I'm, I'm still working on it. Okay, so I definitely want to read that one when it comes out. Like is any uh, aviation books, I, I mean, I just immerse myself in that. I mean, I, I mean, <laughs> there's if you go through my iPad, I'm like, a good percentage of them are aviation related. So with with everything that's going on now, you referenced it earlier. Uh, with MCAS or CCAS, which, whichever CAS it is, <laughs> I'm uh-huh. sure get my terminology correct. With the, the what is it, the 737? Yeah, it's the 737, that, the Max version. Yeah. That's the one. That's the two that, that's gone down over the last couple of months or so. It is. That's the yeah. one that's just gotten grounded. It it did yes, and, and you know ironically, it's probably the safest airplane out there right now. 
um, because there's not a pilot anywhere that has not looked up <laughs> right. what, what MCAS is, you know, how to disable it, what to look for. Um, so hopefully Boeing will, will get a handle on this. And right now it's, it's mostly a perception issue, right. um, trying to explain how they have the, the problem handled. Now, how different, because I know for each aircraft, you have to get a different rating. And right. I know even from whenever I fool around on the simulator and go from aircraft to aircraft. But how different are they? I mean, are they, I mean, is it really? Well, that's, and so that is the problem. Um, within the, 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 the 737 itself, there's some variance in there. And so it's not a separate type rating. So... This is, you know, they kind of do a variables list of, of what's different between this model and that model. So you can get a type rating on the 737 and be able to fly a whole bunch of different versions of it. Um, the MCAS is, is a line item, kind of a list of the variances in there, um, but there was no further explanation of how a pilot will interact with um, an MCAS if it's operating incorrectly. Right. Um, so... Every flight department handles training a different way, and you know, you, you're going to probably see variances between um, the Lion Air and the Ethiopian and U.S. carriers and how they're handling those, that, that type of training. But, um, uh, yeah, it, you know, it, was, it was just a minor subsystem that the engineers thought the pilots would never even have to deal with, and, right. and here we are two, two instances in and still trying to figure it out. Well, again, for the flying public, to help you ease some of your fears, in an airplane, everything has redundancies. Every yeah. system in there is redundant. So in the event that one part of it failed, there's something that would kick in to back it up. Um, so to Erica's point, they're now trying to just figure out, okay, what's going on with this system that could be you know, causing some issues here? But again, do not be afraid of flying. Um, I just think for me, I just, I mean, I just like, if you're the captain of something that here, I just can only imagine back to this ego thing. It's like this feeling of power. <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 do you, I mean, okay, let me, let me put it to you. I'll, 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 I'll parallel it this way. I'm the principal of a school. That's my slash. Like I said, I'm an educator. And there are times whenever I pull up to the building and say, wow, that this, everything that goes on in here is my responsibility. Do you ever step up to a 747, 737, 727, or whatever your aircraft you're flying and say, wow, this is my every responsibility? Time. <laughs> every time. Every time I walk up to that airplane, I think, wow, <laughs> they are going to let me fly this thing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I'm going to put 173 people behind me, and I'm going to be in charge of it, and I'm going to safely get this thing from here to there, and we're going to have some fun doing it. Yeah, it, 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 that has got to be like an awesome feeling just like wow like i i can't even i can't even sit there and fathom it in terms of something that huge that you know two or three of you do you know if it's you in first office or whatever you walk up to and say yeah this is this is our vehicle we we run this we're like <laughs> that is I mean, so in terms of now because this is women's history month and and the women more and more are entering the field what is your advice to girls who want to be pilots um, I know it sounds simple, but start networking. Start talking even on simple platforms like LinkedIn. Facebook even has a few pages for female aviators. Start entering into their world and their experiences and, and you know, be truthful with yourself with the challenges ahead. Um, I, I think women enter the industry and become quickly disillusioned because there are, are a lot of challenges um, it's not an easy career for family, um, and but you definitely can handle it. You just need to put that issue in front of you and, and figure out how you're going to deal with it. Um, and part of it is just hearing other people's experiences. So, um, you know, if, they, if anybody needs advice or wants uh, me to connect them with another pilot in their area, just tell them to give me, a, give me an email and I'll, I'll set them up. Well, again, I'm looking forward to reading the next book, the one that you're working on. I know it said it's going to be released in 2019. So you said you're still working on it. So it's, it's not out yet. And that is, let me see, are, are, is that the final title or are you, I mean, you, like, that's the title or are you, is that the one you're still, you I'm know? I'm pretty sure that's going to be the title. <laughs> okay. Well, I yeah. will definitely be looking to that one. And it is the art of being a pilot. 
Definitely yeah. want to read that one. And then <laughs> if we want to come back on the air to talk about that one, we can do that because all my guests always have an open invite to come back on the show. And I thank you so much for rising early in mountain time because you're calling out of Denver, correct? That's correct, yep. All right, so you're calling out of Denver. And no, the dogs, they did not bark. I did not hear them, at least if they did bark. <laughs> I heard some whining, but they did good. <laughs> <laughs> they did really well. So you you have to give them a treat or a pet or a hug or something. So you, I have three faces looking at me through the office door. <laughs> <laughs> Well, again, I thank you so much for taking the time. Like I said, this this cut across two of my slashes or passions or whatever you want to call it. But really, I just, oh, it's just something about the airline industry. I don't know what it is for me. And I think there's a lot of us out there like that. <laughs> that just is, uh, yeah, exactly. It's just something about being around airplanes and airports and, and the uniforms and so forth and so on. And then there are others that are like, look, I have to do that because I have to go from point A to point B. If I didn't have to, I wouldn't. <laughs> but Right. You are an aviation geek. I'm so glad you're in the herd. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely right. So I tell you what, what I do for the last couple of minutes of the interview is I actually shut the microphones off on my end. And I allow my guests to promote anything they'd like to promote, any shout outs you'd like to make, book signings, how to get the book, how to get in touch with you, your website. Oh, which I love, by the way, that cockpit. I mean, I love it. I mean, it's like you open up your website and you feel like you're sitting in there. Uh, but anything you want to promote, you have the opportunity to promote. So I'm going to be quiet. You can say anything with the exception of a dollar amount. But other than that, okay. the mic's yours. It's a deal. All right. Thank you so much, Mark, for having me. And I enjoy talking to all the aviation geeks out there. Um, you can find me on social media anywhere. Just type in the words, the chick in the cockpit. Uh, you'll find most of my aviation geek followers, um, about almost 450,000 now over on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on Facebook and um, I'm trying to work on Instagram. My kids are teaching me how to use that. So hope to see you all out there. I'm, I attend most of the big aviation events out there. I'm, I'm happy to see more and more air shows coming to a smaller town, so I hope to see you at one of those. Um, thanks for flying, and I hope to see you all up in the sky. All right. Well, again, thank you, and I'll, I do record it, so I will email you a copy of the MP3 link. I also archive them on my YouTube channel. That's for folks who didn't want to rise early with us. They can go back and hear it on YouTube. All right. And, uh, <laughs> so I'll send you the links, and you're free to do whatever you'd like with them. Oh, that sounds good. All right. All right. Thank All you right. so much, Mark. That was fun. It was. I had a blast talking to you. I was, I was, I've been looking forward to this since we said we were going to do it. Oh, thank you. All it. right. So keep on, as my mom can say, keep on keeping on. Uh, you certainly are an inspiration with the flying and just your perspective and life in general. Because like you said, life happens. Right. It is exactly. what it is. And we do what we can do to change what it is. But you just can't quit and just can't give up. You got it. You got the right attitude. That's it. So, all right. Have a wonderful rest of your day, week, month, year, life. <laughs> and again, I'll be in touch with you. I'll be following you. I'm one of your aviation geeks. All right. We'll all see right. you then. Take care. Okay. Um, bye-bye. Bye now.